for today's conversation on the hydrogen production opportunities in Alberta's industrial heartland. Uh, I'm Kelsey Brooks. I'm a pol policy analyst with Natural Resources Canada on the team implementing Canada's hydrogen strategy. Our team is, of course, headquartered in Ottawa, but uh, I've been living in Western Canada my whole life um, because it's no argument that the outdoors is much better here. So last month I was actually in Alberta and was very fortunate to have the chance to meet with Mark, uh, who will be presenting today, and have a tour of Alberta's industrial heartland. I was really impressed with all the diverse activities uh, supporting Canada's clean energy transition going on in the region. So if you happen to be in the area of Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta, definitely take some time for a visit. Um, and I just wanted to say as well that Alberta on a whole is playing a key role in Canada's developing hydrogen economy. There are many lessons to be learned from the success of the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub and the rest of the heartland, uh, which will be instrumental for developing hydrogen hubs across different regions of Canada and serve as a blueprint for domestic as well as even uh, international regions. So before we begin, sorry, before we begin, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Diné, and Nakota Sioux. We encourage everyone watching to reflect on the territory, treaties, and people where you live and work. So this webinar is a part of the Edmonton Hydrogen Hub's webinar series on a building a low carbon hydrogen economy in the Edmonton region. Um, these monthly conversations are meant to provide industry, government, and investors with the knowledge and tools they need to take advantage of the Edmonton region's potential for low cost, low carbon hydrogen, and to contribute to the development of this new energy system. You can see our past webinars on our website at erh2.ca, and this presentation will be available there tomorrow. So if you find it interesting, be sure to share it with your colleagues. I know I'll be sharing it with mine. And for information and updates about future webinars, be sure to join our mailing list and follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. And before we get started, uh, I'd like to remind those of you who are watching from the Edmonton region that the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub is hosting a one-day summit on February 7th at the Edmonton Convention Center with expert panelists, sneak peeks of hydrogen-powered heavy-duty vehicles, industry pitch sessions, and more. Uh, registration is open now, so visit erh2.ca slash summit for more details. And so today's topic, as I mentioned, is hydrogen production opportunities and Alberta's industrial heartland. The heartland is Canada's largest hydro hydrocarbon processing region, and because of that, it also plays a key role in industrial investment in the net zero transition with carbon capture and storage infrastructure and the world's largest CO2 pipeline, uh, as well as other innovative processes, including hydrogen production. To discuss the opportunities Alberta's industrial heartland is creating for decarbonization pathways, I am very pleased to introduce Alberta's Industrial Heartlands Association's Executive Director, Mark Plamondon. And Mark, I forgive me that I forgot to ask how to pronounce your last name. Uh, is, is that correct, Pl Plamondon? Plamondon, Plamondon Plamondon is fine, but it's, it's Plamondon. It's all good. Cast. All right. Okay, great. Um, so a seasoned business executive with over 30 years of experience and expertise in the management, operation, optimization, and financial analysis of mineral processing operations, Mark leads the AIHA's business development strategy and works with his team to build and enhance the relationships with investors, governments, and other stakeholders across the globe. So um, just a, a housekeeping note throughout the presentation, please put your questions in the Q&A box and then we'll uh, definitely get to those later on in the webinar. Um, and just a note, please use the Q&A box uh, for questions only rather than the chat box as this just helps keep everything in one place. And of course, as you know from other webinars, if you like somebody's question, feel free to upvote it and then this will help us determine the order that the questions will be addressed at the end. Uh, okay, now over to you, Mark, and thanks so much again to everyone for joining us today. Excellent. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, I will share my screen here. Um, just uh, express my appreciation to the Hydrogen Hub for inviting um, me to uh, have a discussion with you here uh, virtually on opportunities in Alberta's industrial heartland. So I'm going to share my screen and I'll chat for the next, I don't know, half an hour or so, and then we'll try to address some questions. Okay. I am going to share my screen. Um, 
And hopefully that's, uh, that can be seen. Kelsey, you can see that. Maybe give me the thumbs up if that's all good. Perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I have a number of slides to walk through. First, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association, who we are and what we do. I'll do that for the first few slides. And then I'll talk about hydrogen production and, and some of the advantages just, you know, with investing in hydrogen production facilities in Alberta's Industrial Heartland. So first of all, our association, we are an association of municipalities. Our members are the City of Fort Saskatchewan, City of Edmonton and Lamont, Strathcona and Sturgeon counties. And we have three associate members, towns of Gibbons, Redwater and Bruderheim. Um, this association, we've been around now, this is, we've been here 24 years. It is a collaborative effort across these municipalities to um, attract uh, foreign direct investment and, and have responsible economic development here in the region called Alberta's Industrial Heartland. And for those on the call who may not know Alberta's Industrial Heartland all that well, to give you an idea of where it sits, on the sort of bottom right here of this slide, you can see in red, this red area is the jurisdiction called Alberta's Industrial Heartland. There's a portion in the city of Edmonton, portion in the city of Fort Saskatchewan, some in Sturgeon County, Strathcona County, and Lamont County. That whole area is 582 square kilometers. It is home to over $45 billion of investment currently in a, in a range of uh, value-added energy processing and infrastructure assets. Um, and it is Canada's largest hydrocarbon processing region. And of course, it is well situated to get products out the west, out to the west coast or into the United States or to the East Coast or the Gulf Coast. So what our association does, the, the, the reason to be is again to, to uh, really to facilitate and grow the economic development in this region. We've got three distinct departments in our organization. We have a team uh, that's focused on government relations that's working with the provincial and federal governments to help inform and help shape policy as policy is being shaped across the country to advance energy projects. We have a team that is focused on working directly with companies to help those companies get up the learning curve as quickly as possible with respect to their potential capital project in our region. So as companies look globally to advance large scale energy projects, we work with these companies and help them understand potential site selection opportunities, potential joint venture opportunities, access to infrastructure, feedstocks, et cetera. And that's what our business development team does. And then we have um, someone in our shop focused on communications, community outreach. This is largely to ensure or help support um, communities and industry, um, uh, ultimately social license. So there's community support in this region for continued development. So that in a nutshell is what Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association is about. Now, if you just talk about Alberta's Industrial Heartland itself, so that geographical region, there are, as I said, it's a $45 billion uh, cluster, industrial cluster, and there's a number of uh, products being produced in this region. There's a significant amount of chemicals and fuels. So all of these being listed here, ethylene, polyethylene, or uh, propylene and polypropylene, uh, your glycols, iso-octane and styrene fertilizers, uh, refined fuels, bitumen upgrading, of course, hydrogen, aromatics, petroleum, coke. So a number of petroleums and fuels produced in the area. There are lots of midstream and utility services and assets in the region, fractionation facilities, salt cavern storage, natural gas, and natural gas liquids pipelines, water and industrial systems, and of course, the carbon capture, utilization and storage systems. And then there's a diversified range of other unique products in this area, uh, high purity nickel and cobalt, um, coatings, powders, hydrogen peroxide, filled sulfurs, et cetera. So the point I'm, I'm, uh, I'm making here is there is an established cluster here, a wide range of products that are produced, really coming out of the natural resources that are in the ground in, the, in Western Canada. And, and this region is a cluster for value add uh, manufacturing of, of these energy products. And a number of the companies that are operating in Alberta's Industrial Heartland, you would recognize these, these companies are, 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 many of them are world scale, uh, well-known companies, very strong corporate citizens here in, in Alberta. And uh, they make up a significant portion of the cluster here in Alberta's Industrial Heartland. So 
you know, our association, when we're looking at uh, opportunities globally and opportunities to grow the industrial heartland, there's, at least recently, there's, there's an amount of uh, interest in really growing the natural gas and natural gas liquids side of, of the energy space here. And so in the C1 value chain in methane, we have uh, investors interested in methanol, in um, urea and then ammonia and hydrogen and liquid organic hydrogen carriers. This is all the hydrogen opportunity here that we'll be talking about, as well as animal nutrition in the C2 space. There's interest in advancing ethylene, ethane through to ethylene and then polyethylene. And likewise with propane, um, there are companies operating in the region that take the low cost propane, upgrade it to propylene and, and move on to polypropylene. Um, there's some other opportunities, and, and lately there's also been a fair amount of interest over here on the far right with uh, a wider range of more diversified type projects, uh, biofuels, uh, waste energy type projects, renewable power, uh, interest in, in the battery space for uh, electric vehicles, et cetera. So this is where we're seeing lots of interest for growth from investors around the world, and we're going to talk specifically about ammonia and hydrogen production uh, here in the industrial heartland. So to talk about hydrogen production, so um, some of the work that the, the transition accelerator has done looking at the hydrogen space, um, they, uh, we had worked with them or they had conducted a study um, looking at the opportunities in Alberta's industrial heartland a couple of years ago, identified that within Alberta, there's about 2 million tons of hydrogen uh, being produced and, and almost 40% of that or about 40% of that is produced in the industrial heartland. And that is produced through steam methane reforming technologies. And around 940 tons of that utilizes carbon sequestration on the back end of this hydrogen production. So Shell Scottford utilizes the um, Shell Quest uh, carbon sequestration infrastructure and the Northwest Sturgeon Refinery and the Nutrient Redwater Fertilizer Facility. They use the Alberta carbon trunk line um, to uh, sequester their CO2 from their hydrogen production facilities. So looking at uh, overall production costs here in the industrial heartland relative to other jurisdictions. Um, you know, there's a study back in 2018. Uh, this is the Asia Pacific Energy Research Center. They looked at a wide number of various jurisdictions as well as various technologies for the production of hydrogen. Um, what's interesting is, is way down at the bottom here in terms of the lowest cost, if this is dollars, um, you know, per, per unit of hydrogen production here in the bottom, natural gas with carbon capture and storage in Canada is essentially the lowest cost in the world. Russia would have a lower cost given their lower cost of natural gas. I think there's some challenges in doing projects in Russia at the moment. So essentially some of the lowest cost production of hydrogen using natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration would occur in Alberta's industrial heartland. Now, this is back in 2018. Capital costs would have moved a little bit since then. And some of the costs associated with solar and wind, which is shown in some of these other jurisdictions and are significantly more expensive than from natural gas. Um, you know, there'd be some subtle changes to this, but in general, I think the trends still hold. The natural gas price in this study was around $3.60 US dollars per mm BTU. So and then for the United States, they're assuming around five dollars and forty cents per mm BTU. So there's about a forty percent discount for doing projects in Alberta relative to the Gulf Coast, and that relationship seems to hold. If I look at the natural gas prices here in Alberta relative to the U.S. Gulf Coast on average over the last five years, if I take the monthly averages, there's about a almost a forty percent discount with prices for natural gas in Alberta relative to the U.S. Gulf Coast. And so that relationship seems to hold, and it seems to indicate that there still is this sort of economic competitive advantage, oops, sorry, economic competitive advantage uh, to dealing with or to producing hydrogen with natural gas resources using, using car carbon capture and storage here in Alberta relative to other jurisdictions, relative to other feedstocks, and relative to other technologies. So that economic advantage is, is one of the advantages here in, in Alberta and, and one of the leading reasons that companies uh, would look at uh, investing in, in this jurisdiction. Uh, this slide here talks about, there's often conversations around the carbon footprint associated with, with uh, hydrogen production. And, uh, you know, 
from the Alberta Hydrogen Roadmap uh, that was put together by Alberta Energy. This is back in November 2021. They, you know, had communicated in that document that the certified project, which is Europe's first guarantee of origin of low carbon hydrogen, identified that their threshold would be around 4.37 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen, and that includes upstream emissions. And, you know, there's a, a paper put out in the Energy Conversion and Management Journal in 2022, this by authors from the Mechanical Engineering Department at the University of Alberta. They um, put an effort in to quantify or have put an estimate in the various hydrogen producing technologies, the, the, the GHG emissions intensity associated with that. And what's interesting about that, of course, there's steam methane reforming off the amine unit to capture about half the CO2. And then if you capture the flue gas as well, around 85%. But for new, new investments using autothermal reforming and capturing uh, you know, in the order of 95% or so of its, of its CO2, looking in the order of around 3.91 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. But if you look even deeper into that, that includes electricity emissions when drawing electricity off the grid. And as we know, the grid here in Alberta continues to have a lower carbon footprint. And as companies also either use different sources of electricity, whether it's combined cycle or whether it's taking some of their hydrogen production to make electricity to then uh, drive um, their production facility, you'd see a, a significant reduction in the emissions associated with electricity. And then likewise, the upstream natural gas emissions, we know that Alberta is a leading jurisdiction with respect to its methane emissions, and they have legislation and regulations in place to lower methane emissions in the upstream natural gas streams from uh, to reduce 45% from 2014 through to 2025. So we would expect these uh, emissions associated with the upstream natural gas also to reduce putting Alberta well below the threshold of low carbon hydrogen as defined uh, in Europe, as well as well below threshold for low carbon hydrogen in other jurisdictions where uh, uh, other incentives or other definitions would be used. I think four kilograms of CO2 per hydrogen is used in some other jurisdictions. So what I'm, in, what I'm communicating here is in Alberta, you have low cost hydrogen production and using the natural gas resources here, there's uh, opportunities for low carbon hydrogen production as well, utilizing the carbon capture and sequestration capability that's here. And so over the last uh, couple of years, there's been a number of announcements, announcements primarily of studies, but there's also announcements of, uh, of, of the Air Products Project, which I'll talk about in a second, but a number of international companies have looked at studies specifically at uh, producing low carbon hydrogen to export uh, to international markets, and that'd be through the, the uh, ammonia as a hydrogen carrier. So uh, publicly announced, Itochu with Petronas has announced that they're working with Inner Pipeline on a, a blue ammonia and blue methanol production facility. Um, they would be targeting a 2027 in service date. And that is primarily to service, again, the Asian markets. Uh, Mitsubishi and Shell announced that they signed an MOU related to the production of low carbon ammonia using carbon capture and storage. And again, this would be to um, service uh, the, the Japanese and the, and the Asian markets. Hydrogen Canada Corp announced that they're evaluating an ammonia project in the industrial heartland to add to service South Korea and Japanese markets again. And um, Suncor Atco announced that they are collaborating on early stage and engineering for potential clean hydrogen project in Alberta's industrial heartland to produce more than 300,000 tons per year of clean hydrogen. And then uh, another project uh, that most of you on the call here would be familiar with, um, Air Products announced their, their net zero hydrogen energy complex in Empton to produce 1,500 tons per day of hydrogen. That would connect into their, their hydrogen pipeline that connects uh, Refinery Row in with Alberta's industrial heartland. Uh, there would also be a world-scale liquefaction uh, facility. So between the uh, investment decision on Air Products and the studies that are being undertaken by world-class uh, companies, um, you can see that there's definite interest in this area with respect to the production uh, of hydrogen. So for those on the call who are uh, working with companies to advance projects or looking around the world at various jurisdictions, I want to spend a bit of time talking about the advantages here in Alberta's Industrial Heartland and why uh, capital investment in this jurisdiction uh, would make sense. So the first is, 
I think, again, it's not a secret. There is abundant oil and gas resources in this part of the world, over 1,100 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. That's about two centuries of production at, at current demand. So, you know, decades and decades and decades of natural gas in the ground uh, that would service uh, hydrogen production for um, future markets. Of course, I already mentioned the low cost uh, opportunity with respect to producing hydrogen from natural gas. There's low cost natural gas here globally. This is just a snapshot. Uh, this is from Global LNG Hub. This is just a snapshot. Um, this is September average, so this will, this will change from month to month, of course. But what I want to demonstrate uh, is, you know, in Alberta, you've got significantly lower natural gas prices per MMBTU than you have in other jurisdictions in the world. Of course, we know why Europe natural gas prices were through the roof in September, and we know why Russians are so low. Um, but in general, uh, Alberta is some of the lowest in the world and a significant um, uh, discount compared to uh, U.S. Gulf Coast and, and at least in the month of September, significant discount compared to Australian natural gas as well. So that is, is a strong economic advantage for this part of the world. Um, also, as I mentioned previously, there is a, a established infrastructure here in the industrial heartland. So that that cluster um, has uh, not only a number of companies that have been operating here for decades, along with that comes all of the infrastructure, all of the skilled and experienced workforce, as well as all the operations and maintenance service capabilities in the Edmonton region that service companies in the industrial heartland. And so that creates, it gives confidence, I think, to new investors that there's a decades long cluster here operating in the energy space. And so the capability is here in order to advance these types of projects. There's also, as I mentioned at the beginning, 582 square kilometers of heavy industrial land in the industrial heartland. So lots of abundant, there's abundant flat land for new projects. And access to fresh water in the North Saskatchewan River runs, runs right through the middle of Alberta's industrial heartland. And so this is key. Anybody per, uh, building a hydrogen facility will need access to a fresh water source. And these last two are worth talking about. So. You know, the, the, the industrial cluster here in the heartland, as the facilities that operate here look towards their decarbonization initiatives and look towards their net zero ambitions, there is a potential market right here for industrial users to utilize hydrogen that is produced in this region. So there's a potential new hydrogen market for facilities in this, in this region. Now, to quantify this is very difficult because it will depend, each facility here in the industrial heartland will have their own objectives, their own processes, their own philosophies, their own capital budgets, their own timelines with respect to their decarbonization initiatives. But in general, hydrogen, hydrogen is one potential pathway when using carbon capture sequestration. And so there is an opportunity in this region with the industries here in the industrial heartland. And then secondly, industrial heartland is uh, in proximity to the, of course, the Edmonton region. And as the Edmonton region hydrogen hub, the hydrogen economy begins to develop, um, there'll be additional uh, demand there. So the, the, the hydrogen hub is a, is a uh, collaboration amongst a number of partners, the Transition Accelerator, Edmonton Global, Industrial Heartland, and the municipalities in the Industrial Heartland, Government of Alberta, Government of Canada. And they, this group put together a base case or a vision looking at where hydrogen uh, can go in terms of the regional uh, economy here in the, industri in, in the Edmonton region. And by 2032, the vision would be in the order of, I think, 470 tons a day of hydrogen demand associated with um, transportation. So hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and dual fuel vehicles, as well as in the order of perhaps 100 tons a day uh, from building heating and, and power. So there's additional demand associated with development of the hydrogen economy in the Edmonton region and the, the hydrogen hub, along with those five partners, uh, are trying to advance that economy as, as quickly as possible. But that's, I would say, another reason for um, uh, or another opportunity for producers when looking around the world for uh, their next capital investment, investment in the industrial heartland. There's potential uh, demand sinks here for uh, hydrogen, both with the facilities in the region as well as in the uh, regional hydrogen economy. 
Um, here in the industrial heartland, there, it is home to around 10% of the large scale carbon capture storage and utilization projects that are operating around the world. This is integral for any hydrogen production going forward from natural gas. Of course, the carbon capture is critical in order to meet that low carbon threshold. And so there's Shell Quest currently operating, and of course the Wolf's uh, Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. Uh, both of these are world-class assets in Alberta's industrial heartland. But in addition to these assets, the government of Alberta has awarded uh, in the region six uh, uh, carbon hub operators or uh, awarded carbon hub operator status to six projects. And so as we go forward here, we would expect additional carbon capture, uh, sequestration, and infrastructure uh, capability to come to this region to continue to support decarbonization initiatives and growth in um, uh, low carbon hydrogen production. This slide is from the Global CCS Institute. It, the very dark red areas are the highly suitable areas for uh, carbon sequestration. And you can see this large amount here in Western Canada. So very suitable region in the world, not that many areas in the world that have this amount of carbon sequestration capability as well as low cost feedstocks. You know, you've got the Middle East, a um, little bit in the Gulf Coast here, but in general, you can see globally, you know, that deep red, highly suitable CCS, not a lot of jurisdictions. And there's a tremendous opportunity here to not only have centuries and centuries of, of sequestration uh, capacity, but also centuries of low cost feedstocks for the production of low cost, low carbon hydrogen. I also wanted to mention that there is, you know, tremendous support from all levels of government to advance the hydrogen uh, economy and to support hydrogen development here in, in Western Canada or in Canada in general. So the federal government has a number of initiatives. So the Strategic Innovation Fund is, is, is an example, along with um, they have um, shred credits, accelerated capital cost allowance. They have uh, identified a CCUS tax credit for um, utilization of carbon capture or uh, investment tax credit associated with CCUS projects. And um, I should also mention that, that they are currently uh, uh, they have identified an investment tax credit for clean hydrogen projects, of which they're currently doing a consultation with respect to feedback on that investment tax credit. So that's additional support. And also the, the three leaders between uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, the President of the United States and, and Mexico have pledged to uh, develop a North American clean hydrogen market. Um, they've just recently done that. So there's support at the federal level, at the provincial level, there's the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program. Um, there's, there's the TIER program within uh, the government of Alberta. And designated industrial zone, I'll talk about further in, in a moment. Uh, the government of Alberta has designated the industrial heartland as a designated industrial zone. And at the municipal level, the uh, municipalities in Alberta's industrial heartland do have a heartland incentive program, which will uh, supplement uh, all of these additional supports. You know, an example between the Strategic Innovation Fund and APIP, you know, the air products facility that I mentioned earlier, they uh, have support in the order of $475 million for that project. So there's uh, unprecedented and, and uh, really strong support from all levels of government. So as companies are looking around the world to advance their hydrogen projects, you certainly have support from all levels of government here in Alberta. So I mentioned briefly the designated industrial zone. So this is unique to Alberta's industrial heartland. The government of Alberta has designated the industrial heartland as a designated industrial zone. There was tremendous work done between Alberta Environment and Parks, uh, the Northeast Capital Industrial Association, which is the industrial association of industries operating in the industrial heartland, as well as the municipalities uh, and AIHA. And, and this, over two years of effort in order to work on streamlining the regulatory framework for projects that are investing in Alberta's industrial heartland. So that positions investments in this region to have a, a more rapid and more expedient regulatory approval process. Um, same stringency as anywhere else, of course, but given that it, projects would be happening in a designated industrial zone, Alberta Environment Parks are able to process that work in a more expedient manner. And so this is another competitive advantage that I believe is offered here. 
And it's certainly, uh, I think, another reason why companies uh, should be looking at uh, the industrial heartland when looking at uh, hydrogen investments. Now, when we talk about, we have talked about the regional demand with respect to the uh, regional ecosystem, the, uh, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, uh, the transportation and, and heating and power, as well as potential demand in the cluster in the industrial heartland. There's also what I believe to be a, a tremendous export opportunity. And so talking about accessibility to export markets from the industrial heartland, you have both uh, CN and CP rail, uh, railways operating in the industrial heartland. So access to the West Coast, Gulf Coast, and East Coast are all possible using these two railways. Um, I think the majority of interest that we've seen with respect to accessing international markets for hydrogen and, and specifically ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, the majority of interest we're seeing is off the West Coast, and that would prim be primarily through Prince Rupert. Um, currently, um, or recently, CN and, and Kiera, who are operating here in the industrial heartland, have, they signed an MOU specifically to look at a clean energy terminal in Alberta's industrial heartland. And this is really about improving the efficiency of the infrastructure in order to access export markets. And so CN and Kiera have, are, have signed an MOU to work collaboratively, collaboratively on this. And I think this would continue to enhance the competitiveness of this region to continue to provide efficiencies with respect to the export and logistics associated with moving Alberta's energy products off the West Coast. Um, also an exciting uh, study that's going away with Trigon on the, on the port of Prince Rupert on Ridley, Ridley uh, Terminal, formerly Ridley Terminals on Ridley Island. So the government of Canada is providing $75 million in support through the National Trade Corridors Fund. They're looking at uh, building a uh, birth two, which would be uh, a birth designed specifically to handle ammonia, renewable and biofuels, liquid petroleum gas, liquids commodities essentially to, to access Asian markets. Um, and so Alberta is well positioned through CN Rail into Prince Rupert uh, through um, this project here that Trigon is studying, I think uh, provides a, a logistics chain in order for uh, facilities in the industrial heartland to access Asian, primarily Asian markets. And, you know, well, I guess the next slide talks to it here, uh, talks specifically about the, the proximity to Asian markets. So this is also no secret to those on the call. So proximity to Asian markets, your sailing time out of Rupert um, is going to be much faster than if you had to go through the Panama Canal out of the Gulf Coast, and it's significantly faster than coming out of uh, Middle East as well. And the opportunity with respect to export markets, you know, the there's a couple of markets in particular that the Japanese government have been quite uh, vocal around their targets with respect to importing ammonia. They uh, are targeting 3 million tons of ammonia by 2030 and 30 million tons by 2050. Um, and in a global market that's in the order of 180 to 190 million tons per year, you know, increasing that amount for just one market uh, is significant. And then the, the Koreans also, South Korea also is, has very uh, ambitious targets with respect to their energy mix, with having hydrogen as part of their energy mix, looking at a third of their energy mix by 2050. And so, you know, this proximity matters. This proximity becomes a competitive advantage. And when you tie that in with the logistics chain that I just talked about from the industrial heartland, you've got good proximity into these markets and a competitive advantage over some other jurisdictions in the world. And finally, um, I wanted to emphasize that in addition to all of those um, uh, advantages and, and uh, reasons to invest in the heartland that I've mentioned up to this point, I think I don't wanna also underestimate the supportive community that you have in the industrial heartland for these types of projects. So not only is there the established industrial cluster here, um, you have a network of collaborative effort here between the industry, between the municipalities. Uh, an example here is Life in the Heartland. This is a collaborative effort between industry uh, and the municipalities here and the four partners, NCIA, Alberta Industrial Heartland Association, Florida Partnership, and Northeast Regional uh, Care. Um, emergency response organization. These four partners were collaboratively in order to uh, enhance communications and dialogue between industry and community. So it builds trust, 
building builds collaboration between these groups such that you have support for new development going forward. And, and obviously, um, when looking at your next investment, you know, investing in a jurisdiction that is welcoming is obviously more attractive than than investing in a jurisdiction that is not welcoming or at worst uh, hostile. So we believe that through the efforts that industry and the community and the various partners in this region have made with respect to collaboration and communication, that you have got a tremendous support for additional growth, uh, responsible growth in this area. And we think that that's a feather in, in the cap of this region uh, for companies that are looking to advance their next project. So, so in summary, the opportunity here is really taking advantage of the centuries of low cost feedstocks through to producing low carbon hydrogen, utilizing the carbon capture and sequestration capability in this region to produce hydrogen for markets that are not only the regional cluster market that's here, the growing hydrogen economy that's happening, but also accessing the export markets, uh, primarily through carriers, um, uh, off the uh, west coast of, of Canada. And you put all that together with uh, some support of community and the support of governments, both uh, the federal, provincial, and uh, regional government, municipal governments that are here. I think you've got a very attractive uh, proposition here uh, and, and competes very strongly relative to other jurisdictions. And so I wanted to emphasize those points to you on this webinar here. Kelsey, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, we can have a dialogue. Did okay. that work? Stop sharing there, did that work? Yeah, I think I've just unmuted myself. So um, thanks so much, Mark. That was a really fantastic presentation. Um, Again, you know, I, I said this when I visited last month, um, but it's just really impressive everything that's going on in the region right now. Um, and, you know, the the Heartland and the Edmonton Hydrogen Hub are both supporting uh, Canada's domestic clean energy and hydrogen build out. Um, but also, as you were talking about at the end there, our, uh, our export opportunity, which is going to be a, a huge one for Canada. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I think before, so we have, I've noticed some really good questions from the Q&A box. So thank you to those that have um, typed your questions in there. Uh, before we get to those, uh, I'm just going to ask one of my own questions. So, you know, you obviously, you, you'd mentioned that 40% of um, Alberta's existing hydrogen production occurs in the, in the Heartland region. We know that there's, you know, lots of hydrogen activities going on, a couple of really major projects surrounding the hub and the Heartland. So ShellQuest, uh, Air Products, you mentioned those ones. Um, so how, you know, potentially on, I guess, a smaller scale, um, how can AIHA assist in advancing, advancing hydrogen projects uh, in the region? And this, this does also relate to a question that came up um, in the chat box, which is, does AIHA act as kind of a high level uh, project management office guiding the hub's development and um, commercialization, including companies that want to invest in the hub? Yeah, great question. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit about how we work with project proponents. So, so how our shop works is we, um, in essence, are trying to accelerate uh, the learning curve for companies that want to invest in this region. So I think our services are most useful for new entrants and uh, for foreign investors who are learning about Canada and how to invest in cannabis. So the, how we would help is you contact our organization and we would assign a team of people to work with you and help you along the lines of site selection services. So walking through all of the potential sites that would make sense for your project in Alberta's industrial heartland, and then helping you with understanding the regulatory framework and the regulatory processes to advance projects. Uh, introductions to potential joint venture partners, if that's something you're looking for, we would, we would reach out to potential partners to see if there's interest for matchmaking. So there's matchmaking services as well. Um, you know, if there is some need for, for capital, make introductions to potential capital providers, um, as well as uh, the relevant introductions on First Nation partnerships, uh, as there's interest there as well to advance uh, Indigenous opportunities. These are a number of examples of things that we do, but it's all working in conjunction with the project proponent. So 
It may be different than other jurisdictions. Other jurisdictions, there may be a, a, an office that has the um, authority to uh, purchase land, uh, award utilities, contracts, things like that. So we don't go to that extent. What happens is we will provide the appropriate information and introductions, and then the project proponent would go about entering its own uh, feedstock contracts and its own utility contracts and its own off-take agreements, et cetera. So not as far as, and even in terms of construction, you know, you'd enter into your own uh, contracts with your EPCM um, company who are also happy to make introductions to uh, companies in the region. So we are a bit of a facilitator and try to get companies up the learning curve as quickly as possible, but we don't go as far as, as uh, uh, really taking the commercial uh, uh, entering into commercial agreements or, or driving contractual arrangements, uh, whether it's in the exact site that a company locates or with off takers, et cetera. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, okay. So I'm going to move to more specific questions from the audience now. So the first one is, can existing gray hydrogen production be retrofitted with CCS to become low carbon blue hydrogen? Uh, and I assume kind of a sub question to this is how, how easy is that process and how cost effective? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, couch my answer a little bit. Um, I don't know exact capital. Um, so the capital is going to be the question always. But in essence, if you have steam methane reformed furnace that you have both CO2 emissions off the flue gas and, and out of the aiming unit, they're they're. My understanding is it's possible to retrofit these things. Capital is going to be the issue. And I don't have an, uh, an answer on capital costs, um, but I do know that retrofits have been proposed. Retrofits are possible and it'll, it'll come down to capital. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I know that there's been some proposed, but I'm not sure of the capital costs either. I agree that'll be the factor though. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, so how much total hydrogen investment is currently planned in the Heartland and the Edmonton region by 2030? Yeah, so in aggregate. Um, so of the publicly announced projects that uh, I listed on that, and, and again, they're not final investment decisions to be clear, these are studies. So, but of the publicly announced ones of co companies that are studying projects, as well as the project that is announced as a final investment decision from Air Products, you add all those up. If you're in the order of, of one to two billion dollars uh, for each of those, you know you're in the order of, of five plus billion dollars of investment in hydrogen producing projects, and then that excludes infrastructure associated with that, right? So. Export infrastructure, offsites, uh, out of scope, uh, offsite battery limits uh, type investments would be in addition to that. But just to those publicly announced ones, now I would add as well that there are other companies looking at projects that have not publicly announced studies. There's also um, interest in other feedstocks besides natural gas. I focused the opportunity primarily on natural gas. That's where I think you have most of the advanced work going on at the moment and probably the greatest economic activity uh, opportunity. Um, but I wouldn't rule out as well. There's potential some scope for biofeed stocks. That is going to be a function of availability and cost of feed stocks, as you can imagine, as well as the monetization and the, the confidence in the monetization of the carbon credits the uh, carbon credits will be even more of a factor when dealing with biofeed stocks to produce hydrogen. And so how those carbon credits are monetized will become even more important for those projects. So um, of the five that are on that list, you know, you're in the order of five plus billion dollars uh, investment by 2030. Great. Uh, so I just, I saw two questions that are similar. Um, regarding competitiveness and i'm sure you can uh this the, this question won't come as a, as a shocker because it's um it's a hot topic these days uh so in terms of competitiveness for the region um first of all how significant is the recently announced federal uh um investment tax credit to hydrogen production in the heartland 
And then um, on the competitiveness, competitiveness side, do you see the inve investment incentives? So of course, US $8 billion um, by the Department of Energy to develop multiple hydrogen hubs across the country being a risk to um, the region's competitiveness. Yeah, so great question. So question in general around competitiveness. So, so a couple of general thoughts. So first of all, yes, the uh, government, the US government announced the Inflation Reduction Act and, and significant dollars towards uh, projects in uh, for, for low carbon hydrogen or CCUS in the US, whether it's 45V or 45Q in the tax code. So first of all, we have, like we can't underestimate the low cost feedstock competitive advantage here. So that gets us a long ways in terms of competitiveness. The government supports that have been proposed. So the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program, that is a material support. And then in addition to that, now you've got the CCUS tax credit from the government of Canada and the uh, investment tax credit proposed from the government of Canada. And all those details still need to be fleshed out as well as the uh, tier within Alberta. So my understanding with respect to tier, uh, I, I'm trying to think of the, the acronym, to be honest, I use it so often, I don't know the acronym, but anyways, it's the, it's the output based allocation program within the government of Alberta with respect to emissions reductions. So, you know, producing um, hydrogen at an output based allocation, and then below that with respect to CCUS on the back end puts We'll put a project in a potential credit situation and an opportunity to then be able to trade those credits. And so stacking all those up against the Investment uh, Reduction Act, I think on first glance, I think there's, you know, we have, a, we have a competitive proposition here in the industrial heartland to meet that. And I think that's good news for us. The challenge is always when we're talking about carbon credits to uh, enhance competitiveness, um, the pricing of carbon credits and the certainty of carbon credits is always a challenge with respect to um, capital financing and particularly the bankability of projects. And so I'm going to say that's a, a bit of uncertainty in Canada with respect to when you're utilizing carbon credits to help create your competitive advantage. So that's a bit of a risk. In general, though, I, I do want to emphasize that the low-cost feedstock, the access to markets, uh, I think does put us on a competitive footing. Some work still needs to be done at the federal, uh, provincial government levels around ensuring that we have carbon credits that are uh, that there's confidence in, that are bankable, that can help with competition in other jurisdictions. I hope that I hope that helps, Kelsey. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, so more of a technical question here that had a couple of uh, upvotes. So, um, and again, two kind of related questions. So why are the carbon emission, the upstream carbon emissions different between SMR and ATR? Uh, and then there was another um, comment in question that said, the uh, ICC, I assume carbon capture efficiency for ATR that you cited 90% seems very optimistic. It's my understanding that there are no currently operating carbon capture technologies um, that have been able to achieve near that level. How essential is achieving 90% efficiency and what happens if we can only capture 75 as an example? Yeah, so the, the carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions intensity um, is from that, uh, the paper that was published uh, by the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Alberta. They used a, um, an average uh, intensity for upstream gas. So I would have to assume using that intensity, the amount of uh, gas that's used in each of the processes must be different. Um, and then with respect, and even for the electricity grid, there is an, an average uh, intensity base for the electrical grid. And as I mentioned, as that electrical grid becomes cleaner, as, as we move forward, the carbon intensity of, of uh, overall production will, will decrease. But I mean, it's, I think it's a a good paper and worth reading, and and, and uh, I recommend everybody go read it. Great, thanks. I'll just take a couple more here, as I know we're running short on time. Um. So, okay, so this is an interesting one uh, that actually my team um, at, and under can is also looking at. So. Could the safety aspect of ammonia transportation from the heartland to the west coast be a showstopper if the risk is deemed too high? So kind of a question on transport options. 
Yeah, great, great question. And that's a good question and, and worthwhile that, that everyone's, uh, that, that we're talking about this. So how I, how I view it anyways, is that um, ammonia moves around the world today, has moved around the world for decades. And so there are management systems in place that enable this chemical to move around the world safely today. Um, of course, risk is, is magnitude and probability. And so if you have more volume moving, additional management systems need to be in place by the logistics companies uh, in terms of ensuring those safety systems are there. But I don't view the technology of moving ammonia as anything new. Um, it is, it, there's a 20 million ton per year seaborne trade of ammonia, as far as I'm aware. Ammonia moves all around North America. And so is it a showstopper? Uh, in my opinion, moving ammonia or any other uh, toxic chemical needs to be managed and safety systems need to be put in place. And, and uh, the logistics companies that move these products around the world today are all experts at doing this. And so it can be managed. So in my view, the risk needs to be managed and uh, I believe it can be managed. And it is being managed as ammonia moves around the world today in significant quantities. So uh, another interesting question. Thank you all for your um, thought-provoking questions. Um, do you have projections projections of labor market needs for uh, large-scale projects? From a labor union perspective, the economic downturn, now an upturn, caused skills work, skilled workers to seek work, work elsewhere. Capital certainty means labor market certainty, which will be key to attract and keep skilled workers. Yeah, great question. So uh, I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but if you send me an email. So we have done in the past, we've done studies that indicate that, you know, with X billion dollars capital investment, there are so many construction jobs or construction uh, employee hours or employment hours associated with that. Uh, it's an estimate, of course. Um, and of course, there'll be different skill sets and all of that, as well as operational. Um, point is that I think your point is well taken that, you know, with certainty on potential projects coming, that will be a draw for skilled labor to come into this region. And, and you know, right now, my understanding with the companies operating right now in the heartland, I believe that they're operating currently able to meet their workforce needs, able to meet their, meet their turnaround needs. But as we get into a construction boom or a significant amount of construction activity, those projects, I would assume, are going to draw skilled labor from around the country and potentially internationally. That'll be up to the governments, of course. Um, and, and I believe that will happen again here, right? You're going to have uh, a significant construction activity, and there will be a need to first you fill all the, 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 the trades positions that are all the trades in, available regionally, provincially, and then you, you, you move out from there. Um, but yes, uh, we have estimates on total amount of man hours needed for per billion dollar of investment. And uh, I think I think it's gonna be an exciting opportunity here for uh, our region. Great. Okay, so maybe just one more question here. Um, so, uh, and this question might've been directed federally as well, but are there any existing policies or standards for hydrogen that provide regulatory regulatory goals or targets for uh, maximum hydrogen carbon intensity? Um, I assume that meant minimum. Uh, if not, would something like this be a helpful driver of low carbon hydrogen investment in Alberta? Yeah, so um, so the, for the IRA, the, the, the American incentive, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, they have identified specific thresholds for carbon intensity. And as the threshold gets more stringent, the incentive, production incentive increases. Now, the Canadian government is currently, uh, has asked for feedback on some of their incentive programs. And, and as they are looking at their details, it's possible that they look at something similar, right? So for the more stringent or the, the, the lower your carbon intensity is per kilogram of hydrogen, the more potential investment support there is. So would something like, like that be helpful? I, I think it would be. And I think we're very fortunate here as, as I think demonstrated by the numbers as you know the methane reduction uh, 
regulations continue to drive lower methane emissions off the upstream natural gas as projects utilize their own hydrogen produced to generate electricity to reduce the footprint of their hydrogen production. You can have very, very low carbon intensity hydrogen produced off natural gas, which is your low cost solution to be able to compete globally. And so I think to your question around the, the different thresholds, I think, I think that would be one approach the government could take that would, would really encourage having the most stringent or the most or the lowest carbon intensity hydrogen produced. Uh, so I think that's something that could make sense. And I'm sure the federal government is looking at that. Yeah, and, and just to point out, so regarding the, um, the invest, investment tax credit that was announced for hydrogen, sorry, that was announced in the fall economic statement by the federal government, uh, the consultation process for the design of that tax credit is, is now closed. However, I believe there's still an email for the Finance Department of Canada if you have any last you know, comments or questions, um, or feel free to reach out to me. I'll pop my email in the, um, in the, in the chat box, sorry. Um, of course, I don't have all the answers on the design of the tax credit, but you know, we're, we're hoping for um, uh, a positive outcome on that. So uh, yeah, so thank you, Mark. I think we just have a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna kind of concludes um, today's webinar. So thanks so much, Mark, for a fantastic presentation. And thank you very much to everyone for attending. Um, just because uh, I know I saw a question in the chat box, the, the recording of this webinar will be available on the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub website and their YouTube channel by tomorrow. Um, and I think I mentioned this in the beginning, but today to stay in the loop about future webinars, um, you can join the mailing list by visiting erh2.ca or follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, so thanks so much to everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.